Joining me today is Dr. Nils Halama, who is the head of the Department of Trans Translational Immunotherapy at the German Center for Cancer Research, or DKFZ. Dr. Halama, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to be here. Great. First, um, I would like to ask you a few things about the DKFZ. I mean, cancer research is, and oncology are, of course, a very large uh, topic and uh, um, a very large fraction of um, pharmaceutical and medical research. And accordingly, the DKFZ is probably home to a wide range of research teams and research infrastructure. Could you perhaps provide us with a quick overview of how the center is organized to s tackle such a broad field and such a large challenge? Yes, of course. Um... The German Cancer Research Center is an institution that is one of the largest worldwide, but in Germany also the lighthouse institution for cancer research. And cancer research as such is, of course, a very wide topic, ranging from very basic and fundamental uh, biology aspects of how cancers develop, what leads to these changes that produce cancer cells in the first place, um, to translational um, research and clinical trials on the other side. So a broad spectrum of scientific um, fields and areas involved uh, and also clinical di disciplines in the end. And the DKFZ is organized in different departments that cover also this wide range of topics and uh, scientific areas um, covering uh, things um, like the virus-associated uh, tumor uh, development, a cancer vaccine that was awarded the Nobel Prize, this research in this area for HPV viruses. Um, and on the other side, then the clinical development that is also taking place, the daughter institution of the uh, DKFZ, the National Center for Tumor Diseases, has been installed uh, in Heidelberg together with the University Hospital here and with the help of the German Cancer Aid, um, but has been now um, also installed in Dresden as well and there are plans to move this also into other institutions in Germany. So the clinical excellence and expertise is also included in this, uh, in this joint venture and this endeavor of bridging a vast array of different um, research and clinical aspects of cancer uh, from all aspects, radiation oncology, um, metabolomics, um, what makes uh, tumor cells grow, what is needed uh, to uh, sequence the, the, um, the material in, the, uh, in cells that makes up the program of these tumor cells, how this is uh, modulated over time and what makes tumor cells a tumor uh, cell in the end. So these multiple aspects are covered and this makes uh, the DKFZ very strong in this com um, uh, competition and in this um, competing uh, field uh, worldwide. And that's the advantage of having so many different um, research areas together uh, at one site and in different, um, let's say, institutions that form a, a joint force that leads forward. Now, your own uh, work in cancer and immunotherapies, a part of that is focused on colorectal cancer. Is there any particular reason why this is an interesting indication to um, start uh, researching immunological approaches? Yeah, so um, I have to say that my interest is not only in colorectal cancer, but this is uh, a starting point, if you wish. And the reason is that um, the complexities of the immune system and the interaction of tumor, tumor cells and the immune system are um, a big challenge also in the clinic. If you look at the current situation in the clinic for malignant melanoma, for lung cancer, these immunotherapies have been now established. They're the standard of care for the vast majority of patients in these areas. Um, but if you imagine that there is a situation um, where people, of course, ask, is immunotherapy also um, a good option for other cancer entities, then the answer is typically no, with some exceptions, which means that by far and large, we still don't understand very well what's actually happening 
uh, in these other tumor entities, and we need to better understand this in order to leverage the potential of immunotherapy for these entities as well. And colorectal cancer, but also pancreatic cancer or gastric cancer are other examples where there's still a huge medical need uh, to develop and devise new treatment modalities. And the promise of immunotherapy is, of course, that with immunotherapy, you have a treatment modality that has little or no side effects and ideally is very efficient in killing tumor cells. Um, there is still a huge um, number of problems that need to be solved for immunotherapy to work in all different cancer entities. Um, and that's why I, we started working in the area of colorectal cancer. But um, as mentioned earlier, this has a broader uh, focus on um, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, and other uh, GI cancers as well. So this is uh, more focused on understanding what the situation for specific cancer entities is and how the tumor escapes the control of the immune system than just the single cancer entity. Well, you already um, mentioned the complexity of the, um, the systems that are involved here, such as the immune system and the tumor microenvironment. And I imagine it's challenging to uh, identify a promising approach here. Now, could you tell me which strategy uh, it is you follow in particular and what would basically be the immunotherapy uh, intervention that you imagine it should look like? Yeah, so um, the situation uh, for patients is that there is a number of treatments out there, classically the checkpoint inhibitors, that target a specific part of the immune system. But the immune system uh, is a very complex system and consists of a multitude or uh, a, let's say, different uh, arms that can be utilized, but we still don't have all these suitable tools that can be uh, applied to patients. So in other words, um, the machinery of the immune system is much more complex, but we're still driving around with just a single, uh, a single switch or a single uh, lever that we can pull or push. And that's, of course, not enough for a successful immunotherapy. So the aim is to better understand uh, what makes up the immune system in a patient with a tumor disease, with a solid tumor, uh, like pancreatic cancer, for example, and what are the specifics? How does the tumor escape uh, the control of the immune system? So we're currently um, seeing that the situation um, exists in different patients where we have multiple factors coming together that prevent immunotherapy from being successful. And further dissecting these factors, understanding what is needed, gives us, of course, the possibility to intervene here. One big hurdle here is that for a long time, um, animal models have been the gold standard for understanding uh, the biology of tumor diseases and subsequently, of course, uh, for immunotherapy. The problem here is that the immune systems of animals are fundamentally different, especially in mice, compared to the human situation. And this leaves us blind for a huge array of possible interventions that do not work in animals, but do work in, or do possibly work in humans. And this is an area where we have devised an approach where we're only working with human material uh, and if you wish, like a small of a tumor copy of um, the actual patient that is not relying on animal uh, models in any way, which allows us to better understand and dissect the roles of different parts of this machinery of the immune system in the situation and then hopefully delivers better treatment options. Now, I've read that um, one part of your work is uh, research on the CCL5 and CCR5 axis. Could you perhaps outline briefly uh, what their function is, uh, which role they play in cancer, and um, how they can be utilized for cancer treatment? Yeah. So, if you imagine that the immunological complexity comes from the interplay of a huge set of differentially uh, activated cells. So in other words, there are different um, 
players in the microenvironment that play together against the tumor or help the tumor if they receive the wrong signals. So these players are talking in a certain language and the words of this language are um, the uh, cytokines and chemokines. These are specific molecules that build the words or the language and we need to understand these words better and there's a certain group in this language that's called chemokines and CCL5 is one of these chemokines that has a orchestrating role. So this means that um, these molecules, um, if they're absent or present, lead to a change of the composition of these players in the microenvironment. And this of course is the backbone for any immunotherapy. So immunotherapy relies on the presence of a certain number of specific cells, namely cells that can kill tumor cells in the end. And if you can orchestrate these cells, you can bring them in, that they move into the tumor microenvironment and are active in the microenvironment, then the chances are, of course, much, much better for immunotherapy to work than the opposite effect. The problem is that these or this language and the words in the language are really, really complex and not easy to understand. And the mixture of these words can have completely different meanings. So it is not only that you need to switch on one word or switch it off, but it's a complex interplay of different words in the right semantics. So you need to have them together to achieve the desired effect. And if that is not achieved, then you have the opposite effect possibly, and you don't have any um, anti-tumor effect that you desire in the beginning. So um, CCL5 and CCL5 means the key and the lock. So this is one molecule, the CCL5 is the one that is attaching to the receptor, which is CCL5 and has certain effects. The complexity also comes from where this lock is, whether it is on one type of cell or the other. And then, of course, uh, different things can happen. In the case of CCL5, the situation is especially interesting as we have learned that the immune system tries to attack uh, the, the tumor. And the problem is that if this is not uh, efficient enough, then the immune system is exhausted, it tries to attack the tumor, but it's not successful, and sends out a help me signal to the rest of the immune system. And for example, in colorectal cancer, we have learned that this help me signal is then hijacked by the tumor and leads to further aggressiveness of the tumor. So the attempt of the immune system to combat cancer leads to the opposite effect that there is enhanced tumor growth and spreading of the tumor throughout the body and the organs. So we were wondering what would happen if we block the specific signal in humans and luckily, uh, there is a substance on the market that is being used for HIV patients where the receptor CCR5 has a totally different role. So uh, we simply reuse another molecule that's already on the market that's only, that's only used for other purposes and not for tumor treatment. And what we realized is that this leads to an activation of the immune system and breaks this vicious cycle and leads to an activation of another part of the um, immune system that is activated and kills tumor cells. So the nice part is that these uh, chemokines, these uh, words that we're using, they have a very specific property. So they're not a global molecule that's everywhere and leads to effects everywhere, but very specific. And this means that the side effects of such a treatment are also quite low in comparison to chemotherapies that can have broad um, side effects and toxicities. Um, these specific interventions are much more targeted and ideally lead, of course, to antitumoral effects without uh, many side effects. And that is the promise of these chemokines, of these small molecules that make up these words, that they can be targeted specifically and have an effect that is then very well tolerable for the patient and has an antitumoral outcome in the end. Thank you. Since the, since you are the head of translational immunotherapy, could you perhaps um, tell me a bit about how the translation of your research results into clinical practice works? And if you perhaps have any um, collaborations, R&D collaborations with uh, industry and companies? Yeah. So um, the use of 
these fully human model systems allows us to better understand the mode of action of different drugs and antibodies and interventions in general in this kind of um, solid tumor diseases that we can investigate. So in other words, that there is the possibility to better understand what different drugs do, how they work, and this is especially true for immunotherapies. So in light of the possible translation of our findings into the clinic, the uh, situation, of course, depends on whether there is a drug or substance that's already on the market, and we can then join forces with an industry partner, for example, to uh, leverage the costs of uh, clinical trials and test these substances. So we have been lucky for the CCR5 um, situation and these findings that we could um, attract a, a public foundation to support this work and uh, pay for the costs of a clinical um, a trial in the end that was successful. Um, but the situation in general is that one tries to find an industry partner who is then willing to pay these enormous costs for these clinical trials and push things forward in the clinic to see whether the hypotheses that are being generated in the lab then pay off in the clinic or not. Um, so in, in Germany, the situation is that there is no a large funding body, no public funding body for these uh, efforts, so that if you develop a totally new treatment options, we have actually three that are currently um, now moving into the clinic, you need to find a partner that is able to provide the resources to go through all these different stages of the clinical development. You have to imagine that the costs from a, the first uh, in human trial um, until the phase three trial with thousands of patients, if the, everything goes successfully, is in the order of up to or, or more than 500 million euros. And that, of course, is a significant amount of money that is needed to push things forward. So um, what we see is typically that we start, of course, small with the phase one trial, where we test the hypothesis, whether it's true or not. And there we have um, from institutions uh, funding or funding possibilities, but of course also from industry partners. And depending on the molecule and the interest in this molecule, there can be one way or the other how to leverage this. But this is still a bottleneck that's not easy to bridge. Um, so there's for sure more interesting treatment options or treatment molecules that have been developed that are in uh, our uh, lab drawers on, on the bench, then we can actually translate into the clinic and do clinical trials. But um, still the way forward is quite tedious and all the regulatory processes take uh, a lot of time and energy and resources to go through. So one can estimate that there is practically a 10 year time frame that is needed from the um, first hypothesis in the sense of having a molecule that has treatment options then uh, having it in the end in the clinic. So that's a long way. It needs a lot of expertise from the clinical perspective, but also uh, first from the scientific perspective of developing a treatment option that is highly specific and also uh, not prone to produce a lot of side effects <laughs> in patients. So these optimization steps have to be concluded before going into the clinic. And that's also a big challenge here. And we have been lucky that um, the discussions with the authorities regarding our human model uh, have been very successful and we uh, were granted uh, opportunities in using our fully human system then to shortcut uh, many of these animal models to uh, not undergo these uh, routinely uh, instead of providing our data from uh, our test models. And this allows to speed up the process to a certain um, to a certain aspect, but uh, there's still plenty of time that has to go by before things end up in the clinic in actual patients. And then you still have to see whether it works as it was planned or not. So there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in this whole process. Well, Dr. Halama, thank you very much for these uh, interesting insights. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> well, my pleasure.